Hi, my name is Aaron. Welcome back to the Canadian Science Policy Conference. And I'm here with Dr. Ted Shu, who is a science advocate and former member of Parliament. How are you doing today? It's good to be here. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So um, you're launching an initiative uh, called Knowing Counts. Uh, can you tell us about it and why it's important to Canadians? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm worried about what people call the post-truth world. And it, there are reasons why it's like this. Um, I think a lot of people feel that things are becoming more complex. They're living in a more complex world. And because of that, they're retreating back to ideology. Mm -hmm. There has been a decades-long decrease in trust of public institutions and trust, dis, distrust of um, experts. And that can lead to uh, distrust of science-informed and fact and argument-informed mm -hmm. uh, policy making. And so uh, populists have taken advantage of that and uh, democracy, I think, has been undermined. And you can see the results uh, with the, the Brexit campaign and the, the campaign, the U.S. presidential campaign south of mm -hmm, the border. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about that. Now, I have a particular niche that I think I can uh, contribute in to deal with this uh, issue. And that is to collect stories about how uh, census data has been used to help people in their everyday lives mm -hmm. and to retell these stories in an engaging way so that people mm -hmm. get a sense of uh, um, how uh, data has helped them in their lives. And this is data that didn't come from on high, from some laboratory, mm -hmm. from some expert mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. This is data that every Canadian and their neighbors contributed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can look at it and you can say, look, this is when your neighbor filled out the census, this is how they helped you. And here's a mm -hmm. story. One of the stories I already have is about how in Milton, mm -hmm. which is a fast growing immigrant town, mm -hmm. uh, in 2014, they spent too much money on uh, childcare spaces. They created too many childcare spaces. Mm -hmm. And why was that? It was because of uh, poor census data in 2011. Mm -hmm. They underestimated the fraction of new immigrant families in their community. Mm -hmm. And new immigrants tend not to use childcare. Maybe something mm -hmm. like 20% of mm -hmm. new immigrant mm -hmm. families who could use childcare use it. Whereas in the general population, it's 80%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there's more new immigrant families than you think, mm -hmm. uh, you actually don't need as many childcare spaces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think people, the average person understands that. The average person, the average person understands we wasted money because we misestimated mm -hmm. the composition of the population. Mm -hmm. And the average person understands what childcare is. Yeah. Right. So I think that if we can tell these stories in an engaging way so that people can understand them and retell them to their friends, mm -hmm. there will be a sense in the population, um, we will, we will uh, support the sense in the population that um, data can help. Mm -hmm. Data and using facts and evidence to inform your your policy making, mm -hmm. your decision making, uh, can help make your life better. And that will um, help to buttress society against yes. the sort of corrosive effects of this post-truth world that people say we're we're in. And I think there's examples of that if, yes. you, if you look around the world. Yeah. So that's my. That's my current uh, project. No, and it's, it's very amazing. I'm very uh, excited to hear that you're doing this. Um, and, it's, some... and it's called Knowing Counts. Knowing Counts, exactly. <laughs> and I'm looking for stories. I'm, yes. I'm looking for the, the raw ingredients of stories. So if anybody's mm -hmm. watching this video and uh, work, and you work with census data, or you have worked with census data, um, or, or even data that's where you use the census to frame the survey so that you have a proper unbiased sample, mm -hmm. um, I would love to talk to you, to get in contact with you, to collect uh, the information so that I can try to create an engaging story. And I hope you won't hesitate to contact me. Awesome. So uh, you hold a PhD in physics, but uh, you've left the sort of the academic world behind. Uh, you left it uh, a few years ago. How well did these experiences as a researcher and as a physicist mm -hmm. help in the rest of your career as a, uh, in finance and then as a member of parliament? I think you do acquire uh, a number of skills that can be used. And let me just backtrack a little bit and mm -hmm. say that most people who get PhDs mm -hmm. uh, actually don't stay in academia. And mm -hmm. I think people who are thinking about doing a graduate degree should know that. Yes. Um, Art McDonald, our Nobel Prize winner, mm -hmm. went and surveyed the 200 students and postdocs that went through the Solar Neutrino yes. Observatory. And he found that only a quarter of them mm -hmm. were still in academia. And the mm -hmm. other ones had gone off to industry, to government. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, all sorts of different places. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you do a graduate degree and you work hard, mm -hmm. you, you come away with a lot of skills. So the skills that I had that allowed me to go into the financial world and mm -hmm. into politics and into running, uh, uh, I ran the not-for-profit uh, mm -hmm. in, in the sustainable energy field. Yes. First of all, um, uh, it's certain skills. So the skill that got my foot in the door was the ability to write computer programs, yeah. <laughs> to do number crunching. Mm -hmm. That got my foot in the door. And then to be able to do the job in finance well, it was, it was mathematics mm -hmm. and the ability to model uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. Physics, mm -hmm. it's physical phenomena. In yeah. finance, it's how the financial markets mm -hmm. behave. And so you have to deal with data, lots of data. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with noisy data where there's mm -hmm. some errors and mm -hmm. you have to like know how to exactly. deal, uh, ignore that or, yeah. or uh, work around it. Um, when it comes to politics, I had my a, a network of uh, people, scientists that I knew, where mm -hmm. I could go and contact them and find out information. Mm -hmm. I had an idea of how research groups work, mm -hmm. um, but I think it was more my sort of varied career that allowed mm -hmm. me to look at things from, say, um, an economic point of view, mm -hmm. or an academic point of view, or yes. a community point of view. Yes. Uh, you know, growing up. Yeah. I think it's really important that members of parliament represent a certain community, so you, community can, yes. you can speak for that community exactly, in, yes. in, in Ottawa. All of those things. But maybe I can also sort of unanswer your yes, question, yes. which is to say, to, to talk about the skills maybe that I was lacking. Yes. Um, and I think also training of graduate students has changed a lot since 30 years ago mm -hmm. when I did it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more emphasis on the soft skills. Now, I, yes. in contrast, though I was lacking some of these yes. soft skills, and one of the ones I would say I, I was not very good at, uh, and this is sort of amplified by my personality, mm -hmm. um, I needed to be more good at sort of talking people, talking to people and just learning things mm -hmm. by just chatting with people casually. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wasn't good at that. And the second mm -hmm. thing is, um, later on in my career in finance and, and after that, in politics, and also when, we, when I was running the not-for-profit, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's management skills. Yes. I think in a lot of disciplines, they don't bother to teach everybody the skills you need to manage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. groups or projects when you're a student, and, and there's a good reason for that. Yeah. It's one of these things that you need to acquire yes. along the way if you want to do that management mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. So that was something I needed to work at. <laughs> A lot. Awesome, awesome. Um, so the federal government uh, recently came through with their uh, promise to appoint a chief science advisor, Dr. Mona Nemmer. Um, she's just started her mandate, and I would uh, wanted to get your opinion if you were, if you could give her one piece of advice, mm -hmm. one thing to start right now. So, okay. for a member of parliament and as a scientist, yeah. what what would that advice be? Well. Um, this is going to just be one piece of advice yes. because there are a lot of things that yeah. uh, she has to do in her new role, and I don't want to prioritize for yes. her because that's that's her, her what she has to do. Yeah. Um, what I think is important in the long run is that the public comes to appreciate the value of that office, of the mm -hmm. chief science advisor's office. I think that is important because I would like to see the, this endure. I would like to mm -hmm. see the institution of Chief Science Advisor endure. Mm -hmm. I really believe that a government of any political stripe, uh, if any political party forms government, I think they could benefit from yes. a Chief Science Advisor. Yes. So I think one of the ways that a Chief Science Advisor will be judged is when some kind of crisis comes up. So it could be food contamination or an mm -hmm. animal illness or uh, maybe the flu or mm -hmm. um, there's a famous example in the United Kingdom mm -hmm. where they already had science advice in place, but there was a volcano that erupted in Iceland. Yes. And which disrupted air travel for a long time. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, the uh, geologists, the volcanologists, yes. they, some of them were quoted in this um, government report as saying, well, you know, the government never asked us <laughs> what would happen if this <laughs> volcano erupted? It, they just sort of dropped it in there because mm -hmm. the government normally has a list of possible uh, crises. Mm -hmm. In Canada, I think it's called the All Risks Assessment or All yes. ha Hazards Assess Assessment, something yes. like that. Uh, the Minister of Public Safety is mm -hmm. responsible for that. I think that the Chief yeah. Science Advisor perhaps should review that list of possible disasters and crises that yes. could happen 
some of them have more science content than others. Yeah. But I think that if one of these crises comes up, the what the chief science advisor does to help protect the country, uh, to help the government deal with this crisis, um, will be crucial in the public's perception mm -hmm. uh, of the value of the chief science mm -hmm. advisor. Because mm -hmm. there's always a lot of media attention yes. paid to some, some crises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, my advice would be to s make sure that when one of these crises happens, mm -hmm. that the chief science advisor is ready, because that will be a really big test in the public yes. eye, yes. public side, um, for the value of the chief science advisor. And then yes. you can, if you do a good job, then you can remind people about it for years and years and years, yes. and remind incoming new governments of a different political party of what you did in the past. Now, of course, there will be other ways to add value. This yes. is one that I hope it has the it has the potential to be, be negative if you're not prepared. Yes. So yes. I would just uh, say, let's uh, get ready for that. Yes, that is an amazing point. Um, so we're obviously at the Canadian Science Policy Conference. Uh, what do you feel is the value of an event like CSPC? Well, you know, I attended, I was very uh, fortunate to uh, be in France this past summer when the OECD had a conference on science advice mm -hmm. in Paris, in the headquarters in Paris. And I think that the value of the Canadian Science Policy Conference, first of all, is that it's focused on Canada. There really is a very big focus on Canada and what we can actually uh, do and what we should do in, in Canada. This conference brings together a really large uh, community mm -hmm. of people in government, academia, researchers, industry, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, and these are all the people who are going to get together and work together to do things like put science at the heart of decision making in mm -hmm. government, to make sure that our um, uh, innovation and research and development policies are as smart and effective as possible, that we're mm -hmm. competitive in mm -hmm. the world economy. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting everybody together to talk about these things um, and put in all of their contributions and share and learn mm -hmm. is, I think, very important. Uh, I think that's the main contribution. And if I could put in a, a plug, I would say perhaps the federal government should put in a little bit of money to help pay for people to fly in yes. from um, the further off provinces. Yes. I think that's pretty important. I think it's, for the last few years, the Canadian Science Policy Conference has been in Ottawa, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is excellent because uh, now we're in contact with a lot of people in government, mm -hmm. the politicians and the uh, uh, public servants. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really important to make sure that we have everybody yes. uh, who needs to be here from the east and the west and yes. the north uh, here in Ottawa yes. so that we can uh, um, get together and, and work together in the future. Awesome, thank you. Um, so uh, where can interested viewers find more about uh, No Wayne Counts? Well, I will be, uh, I think the thing, place to go is just to my personal website for personal now. Website? It's, okay. I'm just informally launching it this week, yes. so there's nothing up yet. Um, but uh, you can, people can go to my website, uh, tedshu.ca, so mm -hmm. T-E-D-H-S-U yeah. dot C-A. Um, you can also send an email to ted at knowingcounts.ca, uh, and I will get that email. All right, thank you so much for joining us. It's good talking to you, Eric. Awesome.